Good morning, class. We have a very important lesson today. It's finally time to learn how to piece together a dungeon. I'm calling this dungeon design, but don't let that fool you. This can be applied to more than just a hole in the ground. It could be a mountain or a hedge maze or a narrow winding road. At its root, it's an adventuring day with some sort of structure. What I'm going to teach you today is the two-pass approach. First, we get a broad outline, then we revisit it with detail while adjusting the flow and feel of the dungeon and building encounters. We start with our theme for the adventure. Bakery break-in, crab cult, dragon dungeon. What are they doing and why do they care? To get the answers, we have to ask some familiar questions. 1. Why are we adventuring? Details don't matter, what we need to know is the vague point. Are they clearing out enemies, or trying to get an artifact, or just looting the place for riches? Do they even want to be here, or are they trying to get through or out? This will help us know how to structure our dungeon. 2. Where is this dungeon? The location helps us know what sort of tools we have at our disposal. Speaking of which, 3. What is their obstacle in the broadest of strokes? There's a violent cult. It's a kobold den full of traps. This is giant country. We're not looking for specific encounters, we're figuring out what concept to build those encounters around. If you like, you can skip this step to focus on number four. What makes this place special? There's a crystal that makes dead magic zones, or things that die in this land come back as zombies, or a group has been blessed by the nameless trickster god and act like they have an advantage when they're at disadvantage and vice versa. Now this step is optional, you can make every encounter completely different, but this makes the whole area stick in the party's mind. Now that we made our outline, we can start to chart the flow of the dungeon. This is your highs and lows in intensity and where they're able to rest. In the DM's guide, they want you to slowly wear down the party with 6 to 8 battles, all of which are around the same difficulty and none of which are an individual threat. They chew through your spells and HP slowly without any major spike. It does make it hard to accidentally kill everyone, but nobody actually does that, and for good reason. Honestly, there's just not enough time in the day. Encounters, both combat and non-combat, are the pulse of your session, and we don't want a flatline. What we do want is to control the flow of the encounters to give the session momentum and variety. Still keep an eye on your party's resources and the difficulty, but lose the steady drumbeat. So if the mission's to rescue someone in an enemy base, we could start out strong for the outer defenses, then lower the difficulty as they bulldoze through the second string, then notch back up for the finale. But if they were racing against a clock to stop a ritual, I might have it ramp up from the start, maybe with a fake victory at the end to give them a chance to rest. Make it look like a heartbeat for all I care, but the way that your encounters flow into each other is a tool, and we can use it to craft a better experience. And with that, we now have an overview of the dungeon. From here, we can pick whatever point we have an idea for and start expanding. For instance, I love monsters, so I start with the encounter location and use it to put together a list of creatures I'd love to use. Then I hash out a list of obstacles they'll have to face, be it traps or monster combinations or puzzles. If I have a gimmick idea for the location, this is where I start to integrate it. Don't forget to work out the details of why they're here. And remember, that outline you made isn't final, so if you come up with something better in this step, feel free to rework whatever you need. And with that, we're almost done. Now we just need to like the video. Now we just need to look back at our flow and start building encounters. We have all the ingredients, we just need to put them together. We learned how to balance encounters from a mechanical standpoint in a previous video, which will appear in a corner right now if I'm competent. But for a reminder, the party, spells, and HP are resources. We want them to get low, but never quite run out. They can recover quite a bit of HP, but don't have much at any given time and will need breaks to bounce back. The guide would have you take a steady 10 to 20% off with every fight, resting every 2 to 3, but it's better to have the amount vary with each fight as makes sense for the encounter. With this in mind, we decide which encounters we want to use and where on the chart we want to use them. I like to keep battles that focus on abilities or the environment for my low level battles. It's easier to keep their focus on something low stakes if there's something new and interesting to hold their attention. If you're making some sort of building or lair, keep in mind what the players and the monsters need out of it. Most rooms should have a non-combat function to them, and unless they're a kobold or a paranoid wizard, any trap shouldn't get in the way of their day-to-day -day life. If the monsters live here, include rooms they need like sleeping quarters and a dining area. Where those rooms are might change depending on what you need as a DM. If your adventure is trying to steal a recipe from a bakery, the resting quarters for the workers could be anywhere. It could be a random side room or somewhere they need to sneak through or just act as a source of backup should the boss need it. But if they're trying to destroy everyone there, the rooms would likely be in the back of the dungeon since that's where most of the targets are. But try to make sure that the points of interest like end goals and treasures are out of the way. Of course, the best teacher will always be critical thinking. I recommend looking at free maps online or pre-made adventures or even the layouts of dungeons and video games, especially turn-based ones like Baldur's Gate or Pathfinder Kingmaker. Look at where they put their rooms and think about how that manipulates players into following a path. 
How do they deal with people taking a different path? Then use that as inspiration to try it out yourself, and then do the same process to yourself to learn and grow. But if you're struggling, or you're intimidated, or you just don't have the time, well... Okay, look, everyone says not to use the free stuff because you'll never learn. That's bull**k. Learning how to emulate other people is the first few years of every creative profession I know. You do it like others did, then see what worked for you and what didn't, and you'll start to learn why those decisions were made. Then you can start modifying, and then you start from scratch with a reference, and then you're flying free. Though probably still using a reference, there is no shame in it. As long as you aren't trying to pass off other people's stuff as your own, nobody cares what you do in your home game. That's your space to learn and grow and become great. And that's the trick, honestly. If you want to become great, pay attention. Because your first dungeon won't be. It might not be bad, but there's going to be room for improvement. If this is a party you play with often, put yourself in their shoes. Figure out what gets their focus. If this is a new group, pay attention to how they act. Figure out their strengths and their weaknesses. Not to beat them with, if we wanted them dead, we'd drop a moon on their head. We're trying to find out what they're good at and what they like. Give everyone at least one moment to shine every adventure if possible. The caster loves blasting fireballs, so make sure they have some chaff to wipe out. And the next time, remember they took that featherball spell, swearing it would be useful. So you give the party an easy escape down the side of a cliff. Some sessions will feature one person more heavily, and sometimes a character might get left out, but try to make sure that in the majority of your plans, everyone gets at least one moment to shine. That's why we learn their weak point, so we can make sure that everyone gets their moment to shine, and everyone gets their moment to rely on others. That and to not kill the party by repeatedly pounding the blind spot. Anyway, with that, we're done, right? Well, almost. We're done with the prep, but I'm not just teaching you how to imagine a session. No plan survives contact with a party, so the last thing we need to think about is what to do when everything goes belly up. The party fumbles up their stealth or can't figure out a puzzle. They destroy something you thought would be hard or get crit three times and need to rest. They change the flow. Don't panic, you can change it right back. In fact, what you have is an opportunity to make the world even better. They took a rest you didn't expect, so the goblins got a chance to set up an ambush. They barreled through where you thought they would rest? Well, showing up early means the defenses aren't set up yet. Here you have a chance to make the world feel like it's alive and the party has an impact. That's what most of them are after to begin with, isn't it? Don't feel like you're an imposter just because they broke your plan or give you too much credit. All plans break, and the fact that you were able to fix it on the fly proves that you deserve that credit. Now I will acknowledge that this is a point of contention. There are two main camps on how you change a dungeon. The first camp is the classic approach. The dungeon is its own beast. It changes realistically in response to the party. If the players push onward and bite off more than they can chew, they can run, get creative, or fish out that extra character sheet from the note folder. But at the same time, if the players came up with a solution that completely skipped the dungeon, that's also valid. The dungeon master facilitates the world fairly. It makes everything feel truly earned. The highs can be amazing, but it can also lead to crushing moments when your d20 fails you. But on the other hand, you have the modern curriculum. It says that you should modify anything and everything on the fly, depending on what the party needs. Ignore HP, delete rooms, your job as a DM is to facilitate fun. We're telling a story here, and a bit of bad luck shouldn't ruin it. This can lead to consistently good sessions, but good luck raising tension. So which camp do I fall in? Wrong question, where does your party fall? I agree that the DM should have the party's fun in mind. We're a player, and every player should have each other's fun in mind. But that's the catch. People have fun with every way you hate, and that's okay. I've run for people that definitely want me to change things as I go, give them a good chance of winning no matter what they try. I've also run for people who caught me trying to go easy and chase the foe down saying, if I die, I die. That's how it should be. If I ran for those parties the way I did for the other party, it wouldn't have been fun. I know that from experience. Therefore, I stand with communication. Find out what your players consider fair when it comes to mixing things up, or at least tell them up front what you're going to run. And with that, we have ourselves a dungeon. Could you do me one little favor though? My tiny goblin arms are too short to reach the dismissal bell, and it's stuck behind that sub button. Could you ring it for me? Oh, I'm kidding. Class dismissed. Okay, fine, you can't tell anyone, but there's actually four. I fall in the third one, which is the mixed one. I might mix up a floor plan or remove an enemy they haven't seen, but when they see something, be it an encounter or a mechanic or an ally, it is set in stone and I do not change roles. It's basically the type where you tell your party up front where you stand. Communication. However, there is a final, hidden type, where you claim to be unchanging or draw your lines like me, but then you secretly change your roles. It lures you in with promises of consistent, really high points, and lets you play favorites without people getting hurt or calling you out. But if the party ever realizes it, you're retroactively ruined and they will lose all faith in you. I think it's a popular type, but we can never know for sure. Not me though, you can trust me. 
A goblin would never lie to you, right? Seriously though, I don't. I like character death too much. For real this time though, bye.